counselors got to counsel. And sometimes the best lesson is a dunk on a 12 year old's head. Welcome back to Bring It In with Morgan Campbell. I'm your host, Morgan Campbell. It's been a minute, but we had to come back because so much is happening in the sports world. We're going to do a condensed intro this week because we got to get to it. I don't do this by myself. I do this with the best panel in the industry. Joining us from New York this week, sports editor of the nation, editor of 10 books with an 11th on the way, The Kaepernick Effect. Dave Zyron, what's up? Hey, great to be here. All right, great to have you back, Dave. And also joining us from Washington, D.C., where Dave usually is, um, the play-by-play voice of the Washington Mystics, play-by-play voice of the Capital City Go-Go, uh, halftime voice of Canada's failed attempt to qualify for Olympic men's basketball, but the pride of Hamilton, uh, Ontario, and the pride of Humber College. Meg McPeak, what's up? What's going on, everybody? Okay, perfect. So yeah, and before we get started, guys, uh, guys and, 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 and women, young women, young men, like if you're here regularly, uh, please hit the like button, please hit the subscribe button if you like what you're hearing. Leave a comment. Um, if you don't like what you're hearing, hit dislike, uh, leave a comment anyway, because all engagements matter. We are trying to feed the algorithm. So this week, there's a lot like a lot has been happening in the sports world and it's been almost impossible to keep up. We had to leave some really good topics on the table, but the thread that's going to run through this week uh, is the idea that a lot of these rules governing sports that we love, that we love to play, that we love to consume need to change. So the first thing uh, I want you guys to do is familiarize yourselves with a guy named, and I hope I'm getting his name right because I don't speak Finnish, Eero. Let's get this name right, guys. Eero Montrianta. So he was a, a, a cross-country skier back in the 1960s. Seven Olympic medals, in, including three gold. Um, but one of the secrets to his success was that he had a, uh, a, G, a gene mutation that basically pumped up his levels of EPO in his blood, and it made it easier for him to transport oxygen around his body to all these working mu- muscles compared to other people, even compared to other elite athletes. And so later in his career, he actually gets on some stimulants and he gets popped and he serves a doping suspension. But in terms of this natural hormone, this natural version of a hormone that a lot of people take when they want to cheat, um, you can't penalize him for it because it's his body. This is how he's built. And part of what makes elite athletes elite is that they're born with advantages that regular folks don't have. So when you think about when when sports people talk about uh, Montranta, and the end of his career and his legacy, he's not remembered as a guy who cheated. He's not a guy remembered as a guy who existed outside the rules. He's remembered as what he is, like a medical marvel. And when you peeked under the hood, he had this genetic quirk, like this accident of his birth that made him better than a lot of other people. So my question, Dave, if you have something similar going on in track and field, uh, whether you're talking about Castor Semenya, Margaret Wambui, uh, Francine Neonsaba, who are not running the 800 meters anymore for, for reasons we're gonna discuss, or whether you're talking about two teenagers from Namibia who this, just this past week, uh, one of them, I wanna get her name right, Christine Mbomba, 18 years old, ran 48.54 in the 800 meters, a U18 world record, one of the, I think the fastest time in the world this year. Um, and another teenager, uh, let me get her first name right. Beatrice Masilingi, another 400 meter runner, ran 49.5, which puts her in the top 10 in the world. And then they were subjected to medical testing, a medical examination. And the medical examination said that they have high levels of natural testosterone, to which most of us say, okay, cool. Are they taking it from a pill or syringe? No, they're not. It's just in their bodies, except the IAA, not IAAF, World Athletics has rules about women, only women, and natural testosterone in events from 400 meters up to the mile, which means that these two young women who have just demonstrated themselves to be two of the fastest 400 meter runners in the world are now disqualified from running these events unless they start taking drugs to lower their natural testosterone. So we'll start with you, Dave, because my question is... uh, why does our man from Finland get to be a medical marvel? Um, and our two, our two young friends from Namibia are outside the rules. How does this happen? How does this happen? Because they are women, they are black women, they are women from the African continent. And these are the people in track and field who've been singled out and demonized around this issue for years and years. 
I mean, we can talk about it going back to Castor Semenya, but going back to the 1950s, there were discussions in the International Olympic Committee about whether black women should be allowed in track and field because of what they deemed unnatural advantages. They couldn't put a scientific name for it at the time. They couldn't make it look all medical and proper, but mm -hmm. there was a fear about people from the global South overwhelming European competition. And this flies in the face of what we know about biodiversity. It flies in the face of what we know about, um, about human health and human bodies. Uh, the African continent, because it is the birthplace of all human life, has more biodiversity than any continent on earth. Mm -hmm. And yet you have Europeans making the structure and the strictures for what is or isn't allowed. Unless you confront it directly, you're going to run directly against this level of prejudice and this level of ignorance. It's the reason why when Castor Semenya was uh, prevented from running, and one of the many times she was, there were, there were mass rallies in South Africa in defense of her that were attended by Winnie Mandela, you know, speaking out for her because there was an understanding that this isn't just about track and field. Uh, this is very much about prejudice, and it's a problem. You know, nobody said when Michael Phelps was winning all those gold medals mm -hmm. that, well, wait a minute. You know, I remember watching uh, reports, Olympic reports, talking about how his feet and his hands actually yes. are big enough and look like flippers. <laughs> and they were talking about this as if, it, like, what a genetic marvel. He's actually built like a fish. And instead of, but you know, they, they weren't like, my goodness, what, 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 the, a terrible, oh my goodness, someone cut <laughs> off hands, someone removed three toes from each foot. This is an unfair genetic advantage. No, they just marveled at it. You know, no one ever said when Yao Ming was in the Olympics, he should really be playing on his knees because genetically yes. seven foot five is just not fair. <laughs> and it's outside the strictures of what we understand. So we have to look very carefully at who these kinds of scientific, quote unquote, truisms about what testosterone should or shouldn't be allowed. Who are they applied to and why are they being applied there? And I think you'll find a lot of prejudice, a lot of racism, and certainly a lot of sexism just below the surface if we're willing to look closely. These testosterone rules do not exist for men is the other big tell. Because if, like, from a world athletic standpoint, this is what Sebastian Coe said. Uh, we believe that testosterone, whether naturally occurring uh, or endogenous, confers an advantage. But there is a qualitative difference between natural and endogenous. And so, or sorry, exogenous. Um, and so you can't pretend that these are the same thing. It's the difference between being Yao Ming or me standing on top of somebody's shoulders to block shots. But the fact that we're only enforcing this rule, making up this rule and enforcing it against women, Megan, what message are they sending to young women who want to excel in sport? The same message they've been sending for decades. And I mean, centuries, really, not even decades, but centuries, is the fact that women are not supposed to be doing athletics we're not supposed to be doing sports if 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 we could go back and look to dave's point they didn't want women to be doing sports they didn't want women to be playing athletics i mean you see it now with coverage of women's sports you'll see something posted on social media and typically the first comments that come in you know into the dms or into um if it's you know a network that posts it or if it's a player that posts it the first thing that's said typically by a male is stay in the kitchen. That's <laughs> what they want women to do. And I think when you look at these archaic rules, not only by the you know nation governing bodies, but as well too doubled down on by the IOC, they would like women to not be doing anything but looking pretty and making food. I think that's what it stems from. Because if you can look at the natural levels of testosterone, and I understand scientifically natural high levels of estrogen don't give any scientific or genetic advantage to athletes, but are they having the same rules in male athletes that if they have a naturally high level of estrogen, they can't compete because <laughs> it gives them some sort of advantage? You're not man of, enough. Of something. Like, like, you know what You're I not mean? man enough to throw You're, this hammer? Right. Like, and <laughs> right. It, 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 what are we doing? Like, if, if, if there is nothing in a doping test that proves I am doing anything illegal and you have countless medical evidence that I have had a naturally high level of testosterone in my body since I was born, then let me compete 
fairly. I'm not doing anything against the rules that gives me an advantage. Yes, naturally and genetically, I may have what some people think is an advantage because I have naturally high levels of testosterone, but it was not something I had the choice to take. So let me compete. These women should be competing. And Dave said it perfectly. This is a sexist and racist and prejudicial situation because what if a man has a naturally high level of testosterone than what normal? If, right? Are they being kicked out? Thank, They're not being you. taken out, out of the Olympics. They're not being told they have to run a different uh, a different <laughs> level of distance. They're not being told that they, they can't compete in that category. Where Where is the synergy? Where is the equality of having the same level of standard for the male athletes that you are now having for the women. The goalpost continues to move back at the discretion of the IOC, and it's disgusting. Speaking of the best of the best, at least in America, uh, our friend, Sha'Carri Richardson, who we all stand for the other week, um, is not going to Tokyo. Turns out she smoked a little weed before the 100-meter uh, semifinals and finals at the U.S. trials. Uh, her test came, came back positive for THC, which means she gets a, a month-long suspension, which means she is not eligible. First of all, which means her results at U.S. trials are, are DQ'd there. Um, she's disqualified. Uh, second of all, it means she's out of action for a month, which means there is a slim chance that the team will name her to the relay pool and she can maybe run in the relay, but even that is not guaranteed because that sets some precedents that like future bad faith actors, I'm sure, will try to exploit. Uh, but the positive test and, and the suspension naturally ignited a ton of debate and a ton of, a, a ton of debate over what she did and why she did it, but also whether or not cannabis is a performance enhancer. Actually, it's not a lot. People debate about it because they feel like debating. Like the science is pretty clear. Like cannabis, whether you smoke it an hour before the race, a day before the race, during the race is not making you any faster, right? This is not a, a, a stimulant. It's not even like cocaine could probably make you faster because it's a stimulant. It'll get you on edge. But like cannabis, if you get out, get up from off the couch from watching TV and you're high, gold medal to you. Right, because what we what they tell us about cannabis, it does the exact opposite. But here's a quote. I'm going to ask you guys. I'm going to read this quote, and uh, as it relates to Shakari Richardson and cannabis, um, one of these days we should probably either take it off the list, meaning the the banned substances list entirely, or say. Uh, it's there, but at minimum, the sanction should be something like a warning. So you're not losing any period of eligibility. Frankly, I don't think there's evidence of its that it's performance enhancing and or it's a drug that masks the use of other drugs. Who do we think that quote came from, guys? Mm. Uh, I'm going to go with... Uh, it's not Snoop Dogg. I'm going to go with Al Harrington, given the fact that he has done depth research and has <laughs> right. a cannabis company. <laughs> And has been trying to get the NBA to take it off the ban list for years. But it's not him. Okay. Hmm. Dave, who do you think it's from? It's a great question. Uh, I'm going to go with uh, Be Real from Cypress Hill. You would think. <laughs> but it's not. Ooh. That is, it, is that, it President Joe Biden? <laughs> getting closer. It is Dick Pound, who is one of the founders from Montreal, one of the founders of the World Anti-Doping Association. And he is not someone that you normally think of as like super flexible and permissive when it comes to drugs. So if even he can see that this cannabis rule is outdated, Dave Zyron, what are the rest of us even doing? I don't know. I was actually going to guess Dick Pound, but I didn't want to get censored. <laughs> um, here, here's my issue. Look, when you're talking about the US ADA, the, the World Anti-Doping Agency as well, they've got their big three in terms of what makes a banned substance a banned substance. Mm -hmm. When you put cannabis up against the big three, you see how ridiculous, how prehistoric these Bam. arguments are. And frankly, it goes arm in arm with the discussion we were having before, like these 19th century arguments about <laughs> what makes a woman and what makes speed and what is or isn't allowed, you know, in fear of the African continent and all the rest of it. It's like these, these are the big three. Is something a performance enhancer? Well, you know, listen to Dick Pound. When it comes to marijuana, I don't think you can say it's a performance enhancer at all. Uh, the second one, 
is by taking this substance, could it hurt yourself or somebody else in the competition? Look, unless somebody is standing in between you and a toasted cheese sandwich, you're not going <laughs> to hurt anybody. Nobody is getting hurt. And the third one, and here's where we get all 19th century, does this substance violate the spirit of the game? Right. And this idea that it violates the spirit of the game because you're token up in a state where it is legal, by the way, mm. which Terry Richardson did, after finding out terrible personal news about, about the death of her, of her mother. I mean, th this, is, this is what we're taught. This is the, the, the lay of the land. So right. no, you, only think the, you only think the spirit of the game was violated if you're into reefer madness and it's 1952. <laughs> you only think this is going to actually hurt somebody if you're, you know, like, like, I don't know, fearful in the suburbs about your child smoking jazz cigarettes and it's 1956. <laughs> and you only think this is a performance enhancer if you've never done it before. Yes. Um, and so, so there's, this is wrapped in ignorance and bigotry and, and look at the end result of it. We don't get Shakari Richardson. We don't get Flojo 2.0. We right. were going to get somebody who doesn't turn to cannabis and is slow. <laughs> and that's going to be much less interesting than whatever Shakari Richardson was going to bring to the table. Yeah, and, and here's where the two, like the issues get get conflated, right? Like the rule is the rule and Shakari broke the rule. Shakari Richardson got on the Today Show said, the rule is the rule, I made a decision. I broke the rule. She didn't run from it. She didn't blame the taco truck. She didn't pretend that she never heard of marijuana. She said, the rule is the rule. So I broke the rule. And now I'm accepting my consequences. So in terms of, so in terms of that aspect, that angle of it, like I might not like the rule, but the rule is the rule. And Shikari knew what the rule was, but does whether or not this rule still deserves to exist in 2021 is a completely different question. And that's where there's room to debate because the research also shows that marijuana slows your reaction time. And I have never met a 100 meter sprinter in my entire life, but I've met a ton of them who are purposefully chasing slower reaction times. No, I've never, ever, ever. I've, you meet some that say, well, I don't need to start so fast because I want to finish stronger, but nobody is saying what I want to do is wait three quarters of a second in the blocks, just hang out and let everybody get, you know, eight meters down the track, then I start running. <laughs> Nobody's saying that, but this is like, to the extent that, and this is assuming that Shakari Richardson is still intoxicated uh, all these hours later when she lines up, right? Because the other thing people don't know the difference between is uh, metabolites in the system and like active in, uh, intoxication, because it's not alcohol, right? Like THC stays in your system for, it just does. It stays in your system long past the point where you're intoxicated. Megan McPeak, what do you think of the way Shakari Richardson handled all this? I mean, the same way that we have seen black women handle things for centuries with grace and respect. She admitted that she did something wrong, even though we all agree she didn't do anything wrong. But as you mentioned, and she said, the rule is the rule. So by the rule, she did something wrong. But when you think of the fact, as Dave mentioned, that a week before this race, she found out, nonetheless, from a disrespectful and disgraceful so-called journalist. Not even a week. This was like a super compressed right. timeline. This, this is like this during the, the track meet. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. You find out from, as I mentioned, a disgraceful and disrespectful journalist, because someone who would do that and not actually fact check to make sure that this person was aware of the situation and mm -hmm. is the person that tells her that her mother, uh, biological mother, excuse me, just died, you should lose your job, point blank, period. That's a disgrace to, the, uh, to, to, to journalism and to other reporters and to journalists who actually do the job correctly and have respect for other human beings. Take the journalists out of it. It's just a simple respect factor for another human being. You should not mm -hmm. be the one to tell a stranger that their mother just died. So yes. the fact that all she did was toke up and smoke a little, we should all be rejoicing. But let's be real right. here, Morgan and Dave. We know what this is. This is another ar archaic rule by the IOC and other governing bodies uh, that don't want to see a tatted up, long nailed, eccentric, front lace colored woman having excellence. This was black excellence on display 
and they're trying everything in their power like we just had in our previous conversation on the uh, natural testosterone high levels, they're trying to take it out as much as possible so that they can have what they want as their Olympic Games. That's really what it is. Again, like the previous conversation, it comes back to the prejudice of Black excellence. That's what it is for me, because Michael Phelps, Ryan Lochte, DUIs, yet we uplifted them and supported them in their greatness for what? Because I get in a car and I'm above the legal limit to drive, I can literally take someone else's life and my own. Smoking up the morning of a race and going and running is hurting nobody but myself and my chances to join the Olympic team. And at the end of the day, if this was her speed with THC in her system, Morgan, as you mentioned, typically slows you down. I would like to see what she looks like with nothing in her system because what did she run? Like a 10 4, a 10 she 5? Ran, she, like ran a 10, she ran 10 60, I want to say 10 66, uh, wind aided in the semis and then 10 87 in the finals. But in fairness, Megan, USATF like, is, well, but in fairness to USATF, their rules don't give them like a ton of discretion over this because if it was just to USAT, just up to them and just up to Nike, they would bend, they would 100% bend the rules. They don't want to watch, well, Nike might want to. The IOC I should be bending the rules and be like, you know what? Yes. You but were it's, going through each, a lot. We're going to let this one fly. But each country's federation has their own selection criteria. Like, if, and that's or also trash. <laughs> if, if she was in one of these, like in Canada, a lot of the fastest competitors didn't compete at trials like they weren't flying Andre de Grasse back up here to run against all these guys at trials they're like listen you're Andre de Grasse we've seen what you're doing this year you don't have to go prove yourself right and so so a lot of, so in countries with less with less depth of talent you right. can take someone who's an outlier and be like listen you're on the team you you don't worry about a thing we'll make the rest of these people prove themselves but like with Shakira you can't do that and then you wind up subject to all these rules especially including this one against marijuana that I don't think anyone ever thought someone was going to, to, to violate. Guys, it's July, which means <laughs> it is the name, image, and likeness era in NCAA sports. Uh, last, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about whether or not Mark Emmert would do anything uh, to change the NCAA's rules to avoid chaos. And he somehow found like a half measure. He said, well, we're going to issue an interim rule saying players, regardless of what state you're in, um, can go out and make deals based on their name, image, and likeness, bas basically uh, monetizing their fame or whatever profile they think they have. Dave Zirin, four days into the name, image, and likeness era, what is your favorite NCAA athlete endorsement deal or entrepreneurship entrepreneurial uh, endeavor four days in uh, I mean four days in uh, how could you not like uh na 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 how can you not like Master P and his son aka Percy Miller and his son who I've just learned is named Percy Miller yes <laughs> why not name your son Hersey Miller if your name is Percy Miller and um, coming up with a I believe a two million dollar deal uh, working with uh, an HBCU. I mean, it, it, yeah. it, I, I just, I love that so much. And there's, they're like cute and adorable stories about players with dogs, players with this, players that there's, there's a lot of things going on out there. But what, what I love about it most of all is that the world did not end. You know, Dabo yes. Skinny is not running through the streets naked, screaming, you know, and, and there is, you know, dogs and cats are not getting married. You know, the, the, <laughs> everything is what it is. This is the same thing that happened when they said that about, about your sport, Morgan, track and field, that they said the whole entire world is going to change if, if people could dare have sponsorships or duets. And it didn't change. You know, because at the end of the day, what we want to see is excellence on the field. And we want to be able to see the best do what they can do, the best they can do it. And... We're still not there yet in college sports. What what I want to see, what a lot of people want to see, which is these players given the workplace protections that they deserve as workers at these different campuses. But in terms of the basic opening up of the economy, I mean, what's happening is exactly what a lot of us thought would happen, which is just that the, the, the rules of injustice have been loosened. Uh, the NCAA did what they could to stop it. They couldn't stop it. So now they're just going to roll with it and 
Nothing is going to change. Nothing is going to change. The only thing that's going to change is that there's going to be some more opportunities opening up for people who deserve them in this in this particular corner of the sports world. Yeah, like most of the benefits are still going to accrue to either like the highest profile players at the highest profile programs or just people that are like really uh, cool or funny uh, on social media. They have uh, you know grown this organic following. Um, yeah, and the other big change is that yeah, like if you were uh, a guy like Donald Delahaye, who is at destroying D E E destroying on every platform, he was the guy. He was sort of like a pioneer of this. He had a YouTube channel back in 2016, 17. Was a kicker, really good athlete, but he's also like actually funny, right? A lot funnier than like uh, Logan Paul and Jake Paul. And so uh, he gets this following. The NCAA says, "Hey, wait a minute. Uh, you can either be a kicker." or you can have this YouTube channel, you can't do both. Thinking that he's gonna shut down the YouTube channel and keep kicking. He gives up the scholarship, keeps the YouTube channel, and for, and for the most part too, has had a hard time breaking into pro football, even though his YouTube channel include, like features these clips of him kicking 65, 70 yard field goals. And the NFL won't give him a sniff because they think he's some type of maverick for doing the very same thing that is celebrated. Right now, right this minute, Megan McPeak. What's your first, what's your favorite uh, early NCAA athlete uh, endorsement or entrepreneurship play? Okay, so uh, the Hersey Miller one was was pretty funny, um, mainly because of the name. But Dave <laughs> kind of gave it away. I mean, you guys know I love I love dogs, I love animals. So mine was actually Arkansas's wide receiver Trey Knox yes. and his dog his dog Blue, um, <laughs> getting their partnership with PetSmart, which. I would have liked to see him go with a different company because I have friends uh, who are dog parents and they have had nightmare stories and situations mm -hmm. and experiences with PetSmart. So I'm not about that PetSmart life. But listen, Trey, <laughs> go get your money. You and Blue, go get your money. Go and get all, like I'm here for all of them to go get their money because this is this is what it what it is for me is I think of the players who are not the big name athletes, not gonna be lottery picks in the NBA, not gonna be high level lottery picks in the WNBA draft, not gonna be, you know, first round picks in the NFL draft or MLB draft. Mind you, you can be a six round pick in the MLB draft and still make yes. millions. Um, baseball's just work, it just, it, it's like that. Yeah. I think of the players who are on the benches are maybe the sixth person, seventh person, a role player on these teams who, because let's be real, what is the percentage? Maybe four to 10% of college athletes actually go pro and have longevity. Um, so if it's four to 10%, that means like 90 to 96% of the other athletes aren't yes. doing the professional life. So I want them to get as much money when they can and when they are popular as they can, because as we all know, eventually the ball stops bouncing the laces get hung up and you can't swing the bat anymore. So if they can bank some money while they're young and have a little bit of a nest egg, if they do have a short professional career or they can invest it, I'm all for it because at the end of the day, if these institutions are making billions off of them, they should be entitled to something. Absolutely. And like this era also, and again, it, it is, it does bear, keeping in mind that like most people aren't going to make a ton of money. NIL spells nil, which is like what the majority of people uh. are going to get. Right. But it does also like, aside from the famous people, like just uh, even bench warmers who just have a hidden talent, even bench warmers who just happen to be really good at social media, who happen to be really funny. Now they can monetize their YouTube channels, monetize Instagram. Okay, I'm the 10th guy. There was a, I can't remember the guy's name. Remember he played basketball at Ohio State, like kind of at the blog, the, the dawning of the blog era. And he was this white guy, he was a bench warmer, but he just uh, would blog about being this bench warmer, but he didn't make any money. And somehow he got, and so the, he was not violating any rules, but a guy like that now can actually get some sponsors on his blog as he talks about being the 12th guy on the bench. Now, my favorite is a guy named Sean Shivers, a uh, little muscle bound short guy who, who plays running back at Auburn. Uh, not very tall, very muscular, very fast. Uh, my kind of player in every, in every sense. And like almost immediately he's got, he sets up this second Instagram feed called SS eight apparel. And here's the thing. So he's got this logo. It's a number eight. And in the, the, the top cell of the number eight, it says 
heart. In the bottom cell, it says height because heart is more important than height because he's around 5'7". So either he's going to partner with Marcus Stroman and create this heart is greater than height super brand, or those who are gonna wind up bickering in court. Now, I don't know if you two are in or out on Sean Shivers versus Marcus Stroman over who get who has who truly owns the idea that that height that heart trumps height. So first up, my favorite part of my favorite part of the week. We have a, a camp counselor out in Baltimore, uh, Twitter handle uh, at Peep Game though. Yes, game. Apparently, this guy has played some high-level basketball, and he, every year he's at this camp, and they, I guess they have like a co-ed game at the end of camp. Not only is it a co-ed game, but like the people at camp are probably about, how old, Megan? Probably about 12. And this I mean, is they, it probably ranges from like eight-year-olds to like 13, 14-year-olds. <laughs> well, he put up 76 points in this game. Since you're out, Megan, I'm going to ask you, are you in or out? on pulverizing kids when you have when you have the experience advantage and the size advantage and could take it easy on them are you in or out on running up the score on kids come on you know the answer to this one i am all the way in on this i'm sorry that is the best day when you are dealing okay i've been a camp counselor and i'm gonna make this as short as possible but i've been a camp counselor Mm -hmm. That week is exhausting because typically <laughs> you're there from like eight to three, eight to four, you get an hour break for lunch, but that hour break for lunch is not actually a break because typically your group of kids that you're coaching for the week are sitting with you and following you around because uh, <laughs> they're kids and that's what they do. As you know, you both have kids. When they were little, they follow you around and you don't actually get a break. And eight o'clock, that's when the kids show up. You have to be there at like 7.30, 7.15, depending on the camp, you got to set things up. So that final day, when the camp counselors get to take on all the kids, that is our time to remind <laughs> them that we are the adults in the room right. and there are no rules. It is a no rules hold bar. It's like hell in the cell for the <laughs> camp counselors. We don't care. We're blocking everything. If the guys can dunk, we're throwing lobs. Listen. I'm all the way in on this. He should have gone for a hundred. I don't care. <laughs> Take all of it. <laughs> Dave Zyron, you in or out? I mean, I couldn't be more in. And I'll, as someone who's been a counselor and a camper, I'll take it from the other perspective. When you're a camper, there's something incredibly cool about seeing the talents of your coach unleashed. You know, it's almost like seeing Clark Kent throw off the glasses, you know, <laughs> <laughs> all week or all month, you know, talking to you about drills and making sure you're, you're getting your, your foot, your foot down right before the line and, and touching the line when you're doing running back and forth and everything's very intense and exact. And then it's just letting it all fly, letting it all out. And it's like, it's, it's like as a counts, as a camper, that's really cool because it's sort of like you're saying, okay, I now get all the hard work because then you get to come out here and be a full peacock and just shine. And it's the coolest thing in the world. So you're losing to your, your, your coach, your counselor, but every time they drain a three, you're going like this, oh, if they dunk, it's like, oh, if they dunk on you, you're like, yeah, like everything is cool about that experience. So there's no way I would put even a drop of rain on this particular parade. Counselors got a counsel. And sometimes the best lesson is a dunk on a 12 year old's head. 100%. I'm all the way in because I am all for letting people know where they stand. I don't let kids beat me and stuff. If they beat me, they know they beat me. I ain't letting you win a damn thing. I'm not I'm, I'm not for letting oldies, like when I was young, I didn't let the oldies beat me and stuff. I didn't, like my uncle, he was 41. I was 17. He wanted to race me. He was talking all this stuff. I was like, Uncle Jeff, I'm about to show you, man. He's like, yeah, you can't beat me. Because he was beating all the 40-year-olds. I'm like, dude, I'm not 40. I'm 17. I'm about to show you. And we went up, we went up to the park at the top of the street and I kicked my uncle's ass in this race. It was a 50 yard dash. I turned around. I was like, I was gave him like the shikari. I was pointing 10 yards from the finish line, whatever. I love my uncle, the legendary musician up here in Canada. Y'all have seen him on TV. He played with Red Rider. Perfect. But at 41, he had to learn that he had to stick to racing the 40 year olds, not a 17 year old. And these kids got to learn they're not as good as the counselor. And if they ever win, they have earned it. But otherwise stick to beating up on kids or knowing your place. Now, Part two, things got spicy over at Wimbledon. Uh, early round women's match. 
Ayla Tomjanovic and Yelena Ostapenko uh, got into it. Tomjanovic thought Ostapenko was faking an injury. Ostapenko was asking for medical attention. Uh, Tomjanovic first got into it with the umpire, then got into it with Ostapenko, told, called her a liar. And uh, <laughs> they got face-to-face, grill-to-grill during the match and after. Dave Zirin, are you in? or out on spicy tennis player beef and tennis players yelling at each other instead of just the umpire. Oh, I'm all about it because I, I think too often with these sports, we expect all the athletes to somehow be in solidarity with one another or, <laughs> or hanging out in the locker room. And it's like, no, no, the very nature, particularly in one-on-one -on -one sports like tennis or boxing, People ask, why isn't there any solidarity in boxing? Well, because people are trying to knock each other's heads off. Why? You know, it tends to mm -hmm. cut this idea that, oh, this is my brother, this is my sister. It's the same thing with tennis. You know, people are like, why, why aren't more people standing and linking arms with Naomi Osaka? Because they want to beat Naomi Osaka. <laughs> you know, there's, there's not a natural friendship that exists in these sports. So I'm all in you. Know, and, and in the locker room, it can get very tense. So I'm all about that spilling out into the open so people can see it for what it is. This is hardcore competition. Feelings get hurt. And these are some of the most competitive top 1% people on the planet. So I'm saying bring that drama out into the open. I mean, if we could have it decades ago with McEnroe and Connors, we can deal with it in all aspects of tennis in the more you know laid back, corporated, buttoned up 2020s. Like let's bring back the 1970s and do it again. <laughs> Megan McPeak, you're in or out. I'm totally in on this for the exact reasons Dave said. Like, if I'm out there, like, I am not there to be your friend. I'm not there to kumbaya and hold hands. Like, I'm there to whoop your butt, plain and simple. And I also want to know, have there been any uh, cartoon editorials drawn of uh, <laughs> the angry uh, okay. Europeans yelling at each other or at the umpire? Just a... Just the thought I had. Everybody in tennis gets to be angry except Serena. She, yeah, but, all the etiquette police showed up uh, when, whenever whenever she loses it. Again, like McEnroe and Connors, you can just make that part of your brand. You still get a gig uh, analyzing tennis on TV. Dave, you're going to say something. This, this whole episode this week is about angry Europeans. <laughs> <laughs> they, they don't want they don't want people running. They don't want people smoking weed. You know, they, they won't let. But you're allowed to yell at the umpire. You can yell at the umpire without having cartoons drawn about you. I mean, I just think maybe the Europeans need to chill out and just let the best person win. They might need to smoke a little. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Calm down. It all, it all comes full circle. <laughs> well, like, Shakari, as high strung as she was, if you told me she was using a recreational drug, based on how high strung and volatile she is, I would not have said marijuana. Man, like, imagine how high strung she would be on something else. Like, psh. Do it. Um, last one. Uh, over the weekend, Canada had a chance to qualify. Men, Canada's men's team, because the women's team are in the Olympics, but the men's team, full of roster full of NBA players, had a chance to qualify for the Olympics. Uh, Semifinal of the final qualifying tournament, they ran into what? what what's the guy that uh, Sato? What's his full name? Tomas. Tomas Sadoransky. Tomas Sadoransky from the Chicago Bulls, and then a bunch of guys with dad bods. The crafty dad bod all stars versus the NBA players from Canada. The dad bods won. Czech Republic's going to the Olympics. Canada's going to miss the Olympics one more time. Uh, Megan McPeak, are you in or out on Canada qualifying for the Olympics next time? Yes, I'm. I'm in on it, and I think it's because of the precedent and the progress that we saw from this uh, from this tournament. And don't get me wrong, I know all. Canadian fans are really disappointed a couple days later that they did not qualify and they lost, especially in the fashion that they did. Mind you, the Czechs did the right thing. They put the ball in the best player on their team's hands and allowed him to call game. And it was, he didn't call bank, as he said, he called game. <laughs> um, and I've seen that from Sato many times being in DC and Dave has too, but I'm in on this because this was a step in the right direction that we haven't seen in a while from the men's program. You think of the fact, had this happened a year ago, had the pandemic not hit, they would have had the likes of a Ken Birch, a Kelly Olynyk, a Dylan Brooks, a Shea Gildas-Alexander, a Jamal Murray, 
shall I keep going? Mm -hmm. It's like, you think had the pandemic not hit, there wouldn't have been, there wouldn't necessarily have been the injuries that we've seen with these players. Guys would not be in contract situations, worried about their uh, insurance with their NBA teams, getting an NBA contract because they would not be free agents or restricted free agents. So had this been a year ago, I can say with confidence, this team would have qualified. I think they would have won that tournament and they would have won it easily because the roster would have looked different. But that being said, because of that, I am positive of where this program is going for the men's side. All they can do is go up from here. I see them qualifying for 2024. Dave Zyron, you in or out on your adopted homeland, uh, making the Olympics next time out. Men on the men's side. Oh, I'm Women, in. we have no worries. Yes, I'm in not only because they're loaded from a talent perspective, but because I once hung out in a bar with a couple of members of the Czech team and we're talking unfiltered cigarettes and tequila. <laughs> I mean, that 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 can only wrap, you know, you can only roll with that for so long before the RJ Barrett's and Jamal Murray's of the world <laughs> are just like, yeah, um, you're smoking on the bench. So I think we're gonna do just fine. Uh, you know, that day is coming. I mean, I, I just think like if you're if you have aspirations to go far in the Olympics. And you also have one of those neck beards that goes down <laughs> here, and you know, and you're stuck in wind after the tip off. Your your time is probably not long for these Olympic games. I love Sato, but you know Sato is the guy. You know Sato is the one to do it. I think Canada, <laughs> it runs very deep. So the future for Canadian basketball, I think, could not be more bright. I'm out because I'll believe it when I see it, because Canada, in terms of basketball, is not or should not be at the point where they are accepting, like, progress, or we came closer to qualifying this time than we did last time as success or as a cousin of success or as a version of success. Like, Canada, every year when there's a bunch of Canadians on opening day NBA rosters, I get the press release from NBA Canada saying, hey, look how many Canadians there are in the best league in the world. We must be the second best country in the world. Okay, well, maybe you are, but... Uh, that does not get you into the Olympics. So until, uh, as Megan, Megan ran down to us offline, like in the green room, like all the differences between NBA play and FIBA play, cool. But until those guys can master FIBA play or uh, Basketball Canada can make enough inroads in like the grassroots basketball community uh, to make all these players uh, make national team play a priority. And that's not on the players, that's on Basketball Canada to, to forge that relationship and get a lot of people a lot more elite players playing a lot more FIBA ball on the way up so they don't have to switch gears every summer. Until all that happens, I will believe it when I see it. Um, losing to uh, Sadoransky and his uncles, uh, even by two points in overtime, is not success. Right? Canada, either you have standards or you don't. I like to think that Canada, in terms of men's basketball, also has standards. So that loss is not a moral victory. Um, but you know what's a moral victory is anytime you guys come hang out with us for 40-ish minutes uh, on Monday mornings for the recording and then like on Tuesday nights or whatever it is the rest of the week for the rest of y'all. Um, hopefully we'll be back next week. Dave Zyron, until then, tell the people where they can find you. Well, this week they can find me at the top of the Empire State Building <laughs> down on the city that I've made my own, uh, NYC. And so just look up, you'll see me, call my name, I'll be there. Perfect. <laughs> Megan McPeak, between now and then, where can they find you? Always on Twitter, at Megan McPeak, spelt with an H because it's the right way to do it. Yes. And you can find me at Morgan P. Campbell on Twitter, at Morgan P. Campbell on Instagram. I don't do TikTok, I don't do Triller. Uh, Facebook, my account got hacked, so I shut it down. So Instagram and Twitter, where you'll find me uh, talking trash and doing what I do. So until then, uh, if you liked what you heard, hit like, hit subscribe, leave a comment. If you dislike what you heard, hit dislike, leave a nasty comment. We don't care. We just want to feed the algorithm. And we'll see you guys next week on Bring It In with Morgan Campbell. Until then, I've been your host, Morgan Campbell, and y'all don't know poop about boxing.